Canada's immigration policies have been on fire lately, right? It's like every week, bam, there's something new happening in the international student program. It's a lot to process, even for someone like me who likes to geek out about these things, but let's not panic. I've actually been patiently waiting for all of these updates to settle so that we can understand where the international student program is headed. I want to give you a clear breakdown of the changes so that you, current and future international students, know exactly what to do as you're planning your studies in Canada. So let's dive into these latest updates that you need on your radar in 2024. On January 22nd, Mark Miller announced a study permit cap that limits how many international students can come to Canada over the next two years. The cap is expected to result in approximately 360,000 approved study permits, a 35% decrease from last year. However, recent news reveals a discrepancy. Initially, they thought that they'd approve 360,000 study permits, but it turns out it's closer to 292,000. This means the actual number of international students coming to Canada is fewer than initially announced. Anyway, let's take a step back and address the root cause of the situation. I think it's important that we understand what led to these developments in the first place. And I think that there are three factors that could have contributed to this situation. First, integrity. As previously mentioned by the immigration minister in his press release, the international student program has been deteriorating. For instance, there were reports of 700 Indian students facing deportation for using fake admission letters to enter the country. While this news is upsetting, I'm somewhat relieved that it's come to light. Of course, my heart goes out to those innocent in the situation, but still, it's only a matter of time before these various issues that students, schools, and even agencies abroad have been exploiting will come to light. Diploma mills immediately come to mind. So guys, these are basically schools that are characterized by their low tuition fees and lax admission requirements, which attract many students seeking shortcuts to obtain Canadian credentials. This influx has raised concerns about the declining academic standards and student experiences. In conversations I've personally had with genuine students, they've expressed disappointment in their classmates for prioritizing work over academics, leading to inadequate participation and an imbalanced contribution to school projects. Ultimately, the students who genuinely came to Canada to improve their quality of life through education suffer the most from these current practices. So while the study permit cap might be seen as bad news, it does have some good intentions. For example, it aims to filter out genuine students from fake ones. Additionally, it serves as a wake-up call for schools to implement better practices for screening good applicants from bad ones and supporting programs for incoming and current students in Canada. Moving on to the second factor, and it's the housing crisis. I find this reason somewhat questionable because the numbers don't add up. Although approximately 800,000 international students are currently in Canada, they only make about 2% of the total population. Meanwhile, the housing shortage affects roughly 7.5% to 10% of the entire population. The big question for me is why Canada targets such a small population segment to solve the housing crisis? I don't know but maybe there are other motivations behind this decision, but delving into that realm is a whole other headache that I prefer to avoid. Finally, another potential reason for the study cap, albeit speculative, is that the cap could help alleviate the intense competitiveness of the Express Entry program. This program is a primary avenue for many people seeking to immigrate to Canada. But guys, have you seen the draws lately? like OMG, requiring 500 points or more to get an invitation to apply for PR without a PNP is crazy. You'd need to be a unicorn to score in the 500 range without a PNP. This means being of optimal age, having or holding a master's or PhD, having an LMIA supported job offer in a skilled managerial position, and being proficient in English and French. Crazy. What I'm trying to say is that these scores seem unreachable now. And the main reason for these high scores is simply the large number of candidates currently in the pool, which directly increases the Sierra score and thereby increases competition in the Express Entry program. So reducing student admissions by 35% over the next two years indirectly decreases the number of candidates in the pool, 
ultimately lowering the cutoff score and this should improve your chances of being selected for PR. All right, now that we understand why these changes are being implemented, let's examine what has been done. First, they're increasing proof of funds. Starting January 1st, 2024, Canada is increasing the proof of funds requirement for study permit applicants. Previously set at 10,000 for single applicants, this requirement has not kept pace with the rising cost of living, aka inflation. So now, applicants must demonstrate that they have over 20 Gs in addition to covering their first year of tuition and travel costs. Again, the requirement is pretty steep, but having that financial security blanket is better than none. Moving on, let's talk about PAL. Not that PAL, but I'm talking about the provincial attestation letter. Starting January 22nd, 2024, if you're an international student planning to study at a college or undergraduate level in Canada, your study permit application must now include a provincial attestation letter. Canada has a certain number of students each province or territory can accept. The PAL proves that you, as a student, are counted within the limit for the province or territory where you'll be studying. Basically, it's a way for the provinces to show that they're not going over their allowed number of students. Now, how do you get one? Well, to get a provincial attestation letter, you must follow the specific process set by the provinces where your chosen school is located. Since each province has its way of issuing these letters, the best first step is to contact the college or university that you plan to attend in Canada. Essentially, the school where you'll be studying is your go-to resource for securing this important document for your study permit application. Next, understanding the PAL allocation for each Canadian province is also crucial when planning your studies in Canada. Ontario and British Columbia, being very popular destinations, are expected to have a decrease in their PAL allocations. This means higher competition among students aiming to study at these provinces will exist. On the other hand, some provinces like Alberta, Quebec, and Yukon might see less competition with stable or even increased PAL allocations, offering a smoother path for international students applying there. So if you're interested in determining which provinces will receive more PAL allocations and which ones will receive fewer, you can look at this informative table on your screen. Now, a crucial thing to note is that some students don't even need to provide a provincial attestation letter. Here's who they are as seen on your screen. So suppose you're seeking to bypass the PAL requirement. One effective strategy to consider is applying for a master's program, but only if you think this will add value to your career growth. On that note, let's talk about the PGWP eligibility for master's graduates. So guys, a recent policy introduced on Feb 15th now allows for a three-year post-graduation work permit for graduates of master's degree programs lasting less than two years, provided that they meet all other PGWP eligibility criteria. Previously, there was a concern among students enrolled in shorter master's programs, usually lasting 16 months, that they would only receive a corresponding 16-month PGWP. However, this policy change ensures that even those completing master's programs shorter than two years can now qualify for a three-year PGWP. So hopefully this update gives you peace of mind. There's also good news for those intending to bring their spouse or common law partner to Canada. Your partner can obtain an open work permit, enabling them to gain work experience and provide support while you focus on your studies. And yes, I know, this has always been the case, but there's a more pressing update to this, which is effective March 19th, 2024. Spousal open work permits will only be issued to international students enrolled in specific programs, such as master's, doctorate, and some professional degree granting programs. Moving forward, if you're enrolled in an undergraduate or college program, such as a diploma or certificate, your spouse or common law partner won't qualify for an open work permit anymore. So it's crucial to be aware of this new change and its implications. And guys, this just stresses the importance of carefully considering the program you choose to study in Canada. This is what my partner and I, aka Canix Visa, specialize in. Our goal is to ensure that you choose a program that not only meets your educational needs, but also aligns with your immigration goals. So if you're looking for guidance or have any questions about the study process, we do encourage you to book or schedule a consultation with us. You can book that appointment using this link, which is also found in the description box below.
moving along, all this water is making me PPP, or excited to talk about PPPs, aka Public Private Partnership College programs. I know, I know, it's a corny joke, but we're sticking with it. In recent years, some private colleges have been partnering with public colleges. These private colleges offer programs licensed by public colleges, but at a lower cost with easier entry requirements. Many international students choose these programs because of their attractive PGWP eligibility, which allows them to work in Canada after graduation. However, some students who graduate from these programs find it hard to get jobs because the quality of their education might be lower. IRCC has taken notice of these issues, which is why a new policy will be implemented, affecting PGWP eligibility for programs offered through these PPPs. So, starting May 15th, 2024, graduates from such programs will no longer qualify for a PGWP. This rule applies only to students who begin their programs on or after May 15th, which means those currently enrolled or who start before this date won't be affected. Now, if you're affected by this change and you still want to work in Canada after graduation, there are two options you could consider. Option one, you can look into applying for a different type of work permit after graduation. This will be more complex, especially if you don't qualify for an open work permit. So I wouldn't recommend this route unless you can get an LMIA job offer, which is a complicated process and harder to get these days. Then there's option two, a more straightforward, though initially more effortful option and that is to transfer to a program in school that are still eligible for the PGWP. And by the way, we also help with school transfers. So you can, again, visit the link below to contact us if you're affected by this policy change. Finally, if you need to demonstrate your English proficiency for your study permit or school application, there's good news. The Pearson Test of English, or PTE, is now an option alongside other tests like IELTS, CELPIP, and CAL. It's noteworthy because around 90% of Canadian schools accept it. Plus, it delivers results quickly, typically within two days, making it a convenient choice for proving your language skills. And just to clarify, this isn't a sponsored message. I just genuinely think that it's worth sharing. Now that you're aware of the policy changes starting in 2024, here are some key insights to consider based on these updates. First, choose the right province. Your choice of province plays a pivotal role in your academic and immigration journey. Choosing a province with more PALS can reduce competition, but remember, many students might have the same idea, causing these spots to fill up quickly. So it's wise to consider alternative provinces as a backup. Beyond PAL numbers, ensure the province has job opportunities that align with your career goals, as this is vital for your post-graduation plans and immigration objectives. Also, factor in each province's climate, lifestyle, and available immigration pathways before making a decision. Next, prioritize public schools. After the recent policy changes, some private schools are eligible for a PGWP and other private schools are not. So it might be wise to opt for public schools over private ones. If in doubt, you can do your research or ask us by messaging us here at Canix Visa. Next, aim for a higher level of education. With the new policies, professional programs and postgraduate programs like master's and doctorate programs are becoming increasingly popular. Graduating from these programs, you should be eligible for a PGWP and your spouse would qualify for an open work permit as well. The only difficulty is being accepted into these programs as there are high academic entrance requirements. So what you can do is you can apply for the higher education level first and then back it up with a undergraduate program. Next, focus on specialized or in-demand fields. Focusing on Canada's sought-after sectors like healthcare, construction, or STEM can greatly boost your job prospects. These fields are in high demand, offering a strategic edge in achieving your long-term immigration objectives. Finally, enhance your language proficiency. Improving your English language skills gives you an advantage as being proficient in it is crucial for both academic success and integration into the Canadian workforce. But even better, if you are proficient in both English and French, this can further boost your chances of qualifying for more immigration pathways to Canada. So improving your skills in one or ideally both languages might come in handy later if you plan to apply for permanent residency. Anyway, 
That was a mouthful, but I do hope this video clearly sheds light on the recent changes. If this video has helped you in any way, kindly like and share this video. And of course, don't forget to check out all the relevant links related to this topic in the description box below. Finally, questions, comments, or reactions are welcome, so feel free to drop them down below to help each other out. Thanks again for watching, take care and be kind, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers!